Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to Teslino Lake along the Matanuska River in the Matanuska Valley, just about 100 miles northeast of Anchorage, along the Alaska State Highway 1. The terrain is breathtakingly beautiful as glaciers grace the valleys of the northern slopes of the Chugach National Forest. The local topography includes some medium-sized mountains with forests, bushes, and other plant life covering them clear to the peaks. The pines, firs, and birch trees stand over the tall blueberry, alder, and willow bushes that dominate the forest floor. There are lakes and ponds, streams and creeks, as well as muskeg dotting the landscape, creating a diverse area for Mother Nature to fill biological niches amongst. Common fauna include moose, brown and black bear, sheep and goats, and numerous fur bearers like beavers. Hunting is a huge industry in the state known as the last frontier, and you don't have to go very far out of civilization to find success. This part of the world has winter seasons with very little light followed by summers with very little dark, allowing plant life to grow seemingly before your very eyes. Many records for overly large vegetables have been set in the fertile Matanuska Valley and add this potential for abundant food from plant sources and seasonal salmon runs and you get the perfect recipe for very large bears. In the fall of 1972, a taxidermist from New York by the name of Nelson Stymaker hired a guide by the name of Ray Caposella to lead him on a moose and goat hunt. The hunt was successful, and one day, when they flew over the moose kill, the hunters noticed a large brown bear claiming the gut pile. A brown bear will claim a carcass by defecating and urinating on or near the carcass, as well as covering it with soil, sticks, and other debris, and laying on or near it to guard it. The bear was a very large male bear, and the taxidermist knew it would make an incredible mount. The men assembled a plan and set it in motion. They hiked to within about 75 yards of where they knew the gut pile and the bear would be, and set up a spot to observe the bear. The bush was so thick from the summer's growth that only the bear's back and head could be seen easily as it dozed, waiting for its food coma to end. Every once in a while, the men would see the bear swap ends or roll over, but it never did reveal its shoulders well enough to get a good shot. Generally, a shot through the bones of the shoulder on a large brown bear, or probably even a small one, is ideal because it prevents them from getting away and also prevents them from getting you. The men watched for hours, waiting for the bear to stand up or change positions, but it was apparently very sleepy. Toward the second half of the day, the clouds began rolling in and threatened to worsen. The guide decided this was the point where he would try to make something happen. Ray told Nelson that he would go upwind of the bear to try to get the bruin to smell his scent and maybe that would draw him to his feet, offering a good shot. A headshot was out of the question as it would ruin any chance at the record books if the bear would qualify. So Ray sneaked his way upwind and began making noise. Ray began barking and screaming and doing the best he could to rouse the drowsy bear, but the animal didn't budge. Ray returned to his client and commented that the bear was either deaf or had sneaked out. Ray again decided to use the wind to bring his scent to the bear to get it to stand after warning the taxidermist not to shoot him instead. Stealthily sneak to about 100 yards of the bear to Nelson's right. Ray starts to holler and bark and yell again, but still no response. The guide then decides to creep closer to the stand of alders concealing the bear. Suddenly Ray starts yelling, Take him! Take him! in an urgent plea for Nelson to shoot the bear. Nelson scans the surroundings and cannot find the bear through his scope. He then begins looking over his scope in an attempt to see the bear, and all he can see is Ray backpedaling quickly, beginning to raise his own rifle. Ray fired his rifle, and that is when the bear became visible to Nelson from the knoll above. At first, Ray and Nelson thought that Ray was about 100 yards from the bear, but the bear was now only about 30 yards from Ray. While they watched the bear slumber, somehow it had changed locations, and neither man had seen it. When Ray sneaked in the second time, he had walked much closer to the bear than he intended. Nelson fired a quick shot at the bear just after Ray's first shot, and neither had a significant effect on the bear. Both men quickly worked the bolt actions on their rifles, but the bear closed in on Ray too quickly, swiping at him and missing. Ray's situation turned desperate as he turned his rifle into a club and brought it down brutally over the bear's head. Through the rifle shots fired by both men and the splintering of Ray's gun stock over the bear's head, it continued to charge the guide unfazed. 
Ray had dodged the bear as long as he could before the bear knocked him onto his back by shoving him in the chest with both paws. It quickly clamped its jaws onto his right thigh and dragged him back into the alders toward the moose gut pile it was still guarding. Nelson began running into the alders to defend Ray but quickly realized he would lose the ability to see a safe distance and reloaded. The leaves and branches completely obscured the attack but Ray's screams and the growling of the bear as it brutalized him were very clear. Moving for a better view, Nelson could see that the bear now had its teeth buried in Ray's skull and had lifted him up off the ground. It was shaking Ray violently as he screamed for help. His arms and legs flopped limply as his body was thrown back and forth by the enraged bear. As Nelson retrieved more shells, he had noticed the bear had returned to the top of the gut pile it was protecting. It presented a perfect shot, so he lowered his rifle and delivered a bullet to the bear's shoulders, dumping the bear completely off the gut pile. Nelson was certain he had connected in a vital spot and heard the bear growling and rolling around from the alders. The undergrowth in the alder patch completely obscured everything as Nelson held his rifle like a machine gun, ready for the bear to explode toward him at any moment. He wasn't sure where Ray was anymore and began shouting for him and heard quiet moans and breathing in return. Nelson has no idea where the bear was at this point either. Nelson entered the alder patch, a nervous wreck, but had to find Ray. He found Ray and saw him rolling on the ground with the bear laying behind him about 20 feet. The bear wasn't moving, and Ray was yelling instructions to kill the bear. Nelson fired a bullet into the bear's skull from about 10 feet away, and the bear jumped from the impact and twitched a bit, then lay still. Ray was still terrified from the attack, and Nelson leaned over him and held him in an attempt to calm him down. Ray asked him what all damage the bear had done to him, and he was drenched in blood. Nelson could see scratches all over Ray's face, chest, and back, but nothing gushing blood. Nelson could see obvious teeth marks in Ray's temple from where the bear bit onto his head, and its teeth must have raked across his face as his nose and cheeks were torn up. Ray's face was so crushed that he could not open his eyes, and his jaw would not work. He had to use his tongue to enunciate words. Ray's clothes were completely torn from nearly all of his body, and purple bear claw marks covered his entire chest and back. The bear's claws didn't break the skin, but obviously had damaged his body. It was also clearly bitten on his thigh, where the bear dragged him into the alders initially. The men devised a plan to have Nelson use the radio on the plane to get help, and Nelson nearly sprinted the three miles back to the plane after making sure Ray was warm and comfortable. Nelson frantically explained the details and location of the attack and requested a helicopter. Then he waited at the plane for the helicopter, which arrived with an Alaska state trooper and a doctor. The group were soon hovering over Ray, and it didn't look good. He wasn't moving or responding to their presence. The rescue party landed, but it was too late, as Ray was turning blue and rigor mortis was setting in. The state trooper took some photos of the scene, and they loaded Ray into the copter. Once back in Glen Allen, an autopsy was performed on Ray, and they found that his skull was fractured and several of his ribs were broken. Splinters from his ribs had pierced his heart and lungs. There was a fairly lengthy list of potentially fatal injuries to Ray, but a gunshot was not one of them. His friend did not shoot him. An Alaska state biologist returned to the site and examined the bear. He observed that the bear had been shot in each of the right and left shoulders and once in the head. The bear was a large male, estimated to weigh 750 pounds, whose hide squared at nearly 8 feet. I hope you've enjoyed this scary bear attack and wanted to invite you to like, share, and subscribe to our channel and remember to hit the bell icon for notifications. We would also appreciate it if you would share our videos to your social media platforms. Thanks again and please remember to be safe, especially in bear country.